Panza is a senior, Rob Panza is a senior healthcare underwriter within CFC's U.S. focused healthcare team. Prior to joining CFC in 2016, Robert spent five years as a management and professional risk broker at one of the U.S. largest private retail brokerages. Since joining CFC, Robert had played an integral role in cementing CFC's footprint as a key market for U.S. healthcare businesses, published several topical articles, and assisted in the development, distribution, and brokerage of education process surrounding CFC's award-winning bespoke digital healthcare insurance package, eHealth, which bridges coverage gaps between healthcare, technology, errors, and emissions in cyber and privacy policies. Thank you again, and if you are tuning in just now, you are listening to the Essential Checklist for the Medical Malpractice Insurers When Insuring a Virtual Care Company, and we have with us Rob Panza. Rob? Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Krista, and thank you to CTEL for always thinking of me when it comes to insurance-related um, discussions uh, with respect to your members. So as Krista mentioned, we're going to be discussing risk mitigation and risk strategies and risk exposures for virtual healthcare companies, mostly from an insurance perspective. Um, so I'll get started in a moment, but if at any point you anybody wants to stop me for a quick question, please feel free to interrupt and I'd be happy to help. So with that, I will begin. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is basically how do we understand the virtual care landscape as it was in the past and how it is at the moment and maybe where it's going. So whilst the concept of telemedicine has been practiced to some extent since the late 1950s, there's really no, um, there's no denying the fact that COVID-19 really led to the widespread adoption of the virtual care model. Um, basically, prior to the pandemic, telemedicine consultations represented only 0.3% of all healthcare interactions, whereas within the first three months of COVID, telemedicine consultations rose to nearly 24% within that same period, which represents an astonishing near 800% increase in usage and adoption. And as recently as February of 2023, 80% of all people have reported to have accessed telemedicine and virtual care services at least once in their lives. And the adoption of these technologies has had a particularly profound impact on underserved populations, such as patients who are living in rural areas and adults who are over the age of 55 who historically have been pretty avert to relying on technology to receive the healthcare they need, or any other technology for that matter, uh, really with the exception of Facebook. Um, in terms of demographics, nearly 75% of all millennials, like myself, uh, prefer telehealth consultations to in-person care, as we feel that the care provided is adequate and the ability to save time traveling um, to and from appointments and waiting in waiting rooms actually um, is more conducive to the demands of the modern workforce. And it subsequently allows us more time to spend on social media, recreating TikTok dances that we certainly will not regret down the line. And in respect to acute care conditions, which is quite common nowadays, especially with the mental health um, crisis that kind of took hold of not just the U.S., but the world since pandemic. Um, we see a lot of psychiatric and behavioral health uh, practices cropping up all over the place. And the data has actually shown that 96% of all patients find telepsychiatry services satisfactory in the treatment of these mental health conditions. And the research actually has proven that the outcomes have significantly improved in this space since the adoption of the telepsychiatry model for both counseling um, and behavioral health, and also in terms of prescribing medications. So in terms of other virtual care verticals, there's also been an increased interest in the personalized healthcare journey. Um, surely you'll see ads all over social media, online, on the radio, for all different types of companies that are leveraging certain technologies, such as remote patient monitoring with some wearable devices like your Apple Watch, your Garmin Watch, or any other connected device. Um, this can be both for chronic care management as well as lifestyle and fitness purposes. So some popular mHealth applications such as Noom, which is used for nutrition and weight management, and Headspace for mental health tracking have soared in popularity as we as a society continue to prioritize the management of our own health and wellness 
in a seamless and convenient way. And I think one of the things that people have really taken away from, you know, the advent of these technologies is that it gives us the power over our own healthcare information, which allows us to take control over our own health more personally and make decisions that we feel best suits ourselves as an individual. So within the virtual uh, healthcare and digital health space, there are several, several different subsectors. So those subsectors would include interactive telemedicine, mHealth, which is healthcare related mobile apps, artificial intelligence to varying degrees and usages, remote patient monitoring, as I just mentioned, genomics also with uh, a wide range of applications and some of the more heavy duty stuff such as diagnostic assist, uh, assistive technologies, um, you know, perhaps for diagnosing things like skin cancer or breast cancer or um, any other kind of condition that technology could assist a physician in diagnosing. And with the rapid expansion of technology, I'm very sure that we'll see many more modalities of virtual care emerging in the near future. So I think in some senses, there's a bit of a misnomer when it comes to, I guess, telemedicine, as sometimes it's conflated um, or used interchangeably with digital healthcare. Uh, when digital healthcare is actually more of an umbrella term and telemedicine is only just a subsector. So digital healthcare services are not only so <laughs> different. Is everyone all right? Right, moving on. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, digital healthcare is not limited solely to medical providers. Uh, businesses operating in the digital healthcare arena can range from traditional doctor's offices and hospitals, insurance companies, device manufacturers, and a whole other host of software as a service technology companies. Next is identifying the insurance, uh, the insurance risks in virtual care. So some of the, the challenges faced by medical malpractice insurers historically and I guess this is what kind of presented us at CFC with an opportunity is realizing that there is coverage or there was coverage inadequacies with the existing traditional uh, insurance solutions for healthcare companies, healthcare providers, and also technology companies. So what we originally saw was, you know, a business providing telemedicine services coming to an insurance carrier on a technology you know, form, application form. And the confusion there from a lot of insurance brokers and even the insurers themselves is that just because you're providing services uh, with a tech platform, that means surely you can't have a healthcare exposure. You're only a tech company. And similarly, we had submissions coming in from medical malpractice um, backgrounds where they were leveraging services technologically, but not realizing that a lot of traditional med mal forms wouldn't actually extend to healthcare services. So what, what really has presented itself from an insurable risk standpoint is that there's an intrinsic crossover in exposure and thus coverage um, when it comes to companies providing health within the digital health landscape. So one of the main things to think about is how can a bodily injury claim occur? Typically, from a med mal perspective, it would have to be within the provision of healthcare services. And that would what be normally a med mal uh, insurance policy would cover. However, what if the doctor was using a tech platform to deliver their care? And what if that platform failed and it prevented the doctor from providing the care that they needed to give. And this led to a worsening patient outcome, a misdiagnosis, um, or even some kind of bodily injury. A traditional healthcare form, like a med mal form, typically would deem the proximate cause of that loss to be a tech failure and not a healthcare service. So what we would see is a lot of med mal insurers denying claims on the basis that the claim didn't arise from the provision of the healthcare services, but rather from the failure of technology. Similarly, on a technology errors and emissions form, if they were 
only having this coverage for a digital healthcare company. And a claim arose from a provider utilizing the platform, providing a misdiagnosis, and that led to bodily injury. More than likely, almost certainly, in that case, the technology uh, errors and emissions policy form wouldn't respond because they would say that, hang on a minute, the bodily injury wasn't a result of a tech failure, it was a misdiagnosis, and we're not covering healthcare services. Similarly, on a cyber policy, which is likely the most exclusive, but also the, one of the most important insurance policies to have in place when insuring a virtual care company, there's effectively no real bodily injury coverage at all afforded. And we have to think of the instance of a cyber attack happening. Let's say a, um, a ransomware attack takes down the EHR that a medical provider is using to access patient records. They're unable, they're unable to access the records. In that case, they're unable to um, check adverse reactions to particular pres prescribed medications they prescribe because they need to get patient care in a timely manner. The patient didn't have enough time to disclose the fact that they were allergic to a certain medication and the patient ends up suffering some kind of life-threatening circumstance or even, uh, even death in, in, in some cases. Under a cyber form, they're going to say, well, hang on a minute. That's a malpractice claim, not a cyber claim. But it kind of just proves how all these different moving parts, whether it's the healthcare component, the tech infrastructure, or the cyber and privacy controls that kind of wrap everything all together, can lead to claims arising from bodily injury. And I think that's the most important thing to think about from an insurance perspective when we think of where coverage needs to be placed. And the last point that I'll make on this is when you do have different carriers in place and the you know due to the complex nature of a, a claim that arises from tech activities that has a bodily injury component you'll have a few different insurance carriers pointing figures at, at each other trying to figure out who's going to pay the claim whose form does it sit most under and then you lead to uh, you know uh, instances where it becomes very costly very protracted process to settle a claim so I think that's a key takeaway to consider from an insurance perspective, when thinking about where the exposure lies and where the insurable interest lies for these types of companies. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is some potential liabilities and, and shortcomings of the telemedicine model. So I think we can all agree that telemedicine has really changed the world of healthcare for the better, although it's pretty clear that the model is not perfect. And there are certain weaknesses and limitations of this model, which can not only impact patients, but it can impact providers from a malpractice perspective. And also med mal healthcare insurers, tech insurers, cyber insurers from a claims frequency standpoint. So I think it's pretty safe to say that invariably, the most significant limitation of the telemedicine model is the fact that it can be especially challenging for medical professionals to conduct a thorough physical examination of a patient from a distance. This could be due to things of, you know, not being able to palpate a patient, not being able to, you know, um, get a full view of the body, check temperatures and all that. And due to this, this can lead to misdiagnosis or negligent treatment. Also from a socioeconomic and geographic perspective, Patients living in areas with poor internet coverage may actually not be able to access telemedicine services at all. Um, also, if a patient doesn't have access to com a computer, to a smartphone, to a tablet, they also likely would not be able to use telemedicine. And obviously, that is one of the main limitations for people is not having access to technology. And this is a considerable implication um, when we think about health equity and social determinants of social determinants of health, um, which can lead to worse outcomes for the already underserved populations. And I know a lot of virtual healthcare companies out there are looking to improve um, care in these areas where there are quite significant barriers to healthcare services and social determinants of health that arise from environmental, socioeconomic, um, and even racial um, implications.
So now from an underwriting perspective, how do we evaluate a virtual care company? What are the things that we look for to determine whether or not something is a good insurable risk, whether it's on the high risk side or whether it's something that we may not want to touch with a barge pole? So first and foremost, the nature of services and the risk level they present are the main determinant factor of assessing how a claim can occur and to what severity. So for example, a wellness application, which is being used for the purposes of tracking one's fitness journey and managing one's daily emotions presents a considerably less acute risk exposure than let's say um, a company that is leveraging machine learning, artificial intelligence to assist radiologists in cancer detection or cancer diagnosis or a telemedicine provider and platform who is using remote consultations to diagnose pretty severe neurological episodes such as strokes and seizures and all other things of that sort. So clearly that's one of the main things that we would assess in terms of determining, you know, what the likelihood of a loss is, what kind of premiums to charge. Another key factor, and this one is, is quite important, is the uh, clinical oversight being exercised over the medical practitioners who will be treating patients and prescribing medications. So as an example, if there's a company that has lax peer review protocol and the providers are not kept to a certain standard, this can really lead to a detriment in the quality of care that's being provided, which could lead to worsening patient outcomes and the inevitability of medical malpractice claims to occur. So if this does end up becoming a, a systemic issue and a trend for a particular company, it is likely that this might get flagged by regulatory bodies such as the state medical boards or federal agencies such as the DEA or CMS. And I think what's important to remember here is that this could have massive financial and legal consequences for the company in terms of the fines and penalties that might be levied against them or the revocation of one's license to practice medicine, which may sometimes um, take a very long time to have reinstated, if at all. So from our perspective, it really is crucial to evaluate a company's clinical risk management protocol in their hiring of providers, of their vetting of providers, as well as their prescribing protocol, especially, especially when it comes to um, the prescribing of controlled substances. Now, we can't talk about virtual healthcare without talking about the reliance on technology. So it's imperative to determine that the software that's being utilized, whether it was developed in-house or if it was um, licensed from a third-party telehealth software and service provider, um, that this technology has been thoroughly vetted for its functional efficacy, as well as for its, the technology itself, not being in breach or infringement of another company's intellectual property, which is actually one of the lead drivers of claims in the virtual, hair, uh, in the virtual care space, if you could believe it or not. And from our perspective, from what we've seen in the trends in insurance in the insurance in the insurance industry, um, it's expected that IP claims are expected to outpace medical malpractice claims in the virtual hair in the virtual care space in the very near future. So, just to focus a bit more on the um, what good governance is in terms of vetting IP and making sure you're not an infringement of anything, I just took an example of something that came on an application form uh, of how a company would exercise some of these IP uh, controls and mitigation tactics. Um, it's only a short snippet. There was a lot more, but I think this kind of will give the gist. So they mentioned that to prevent intellectual property infringement, we conduct regular audits to identify assets used, perform clearance checks before incorporating intellectual property, and obtain licenses when necessary. We monitor and ensure ongoing compliance provide employee training on IP rights, and seek legal advice to align with legal standards. The procedures reflect our commitment to compliance and risk mitigation, regularly adapting to changes in operations and in the intellectual property landscape. So yes, really important to not lose sight of the fact that there are a lot of people in the space who are claiming to do a lot of the same things under a lot of the same names and promising a lot of the same outcomes with very similar technology. So it is really important that companies are doing their due diligence when establishing, you know, their trademarks and their branding and all of that. Um, now to talk about another thing we need to evaluate is uh, the technology and its potential to fail and what, what implications that does have. 
So for example, let's think about a teledermat teledermatology platform uh, utilizing a picture archive uh, picture archiving system. And for whatever reason, the, the training data that went into that um, model is either poorly trained, is becomes corrupted or inaccessible for whatever reason. Um, in this case, in terms of the technology failing, this could also lead to a provider's inability to diagnose or treat patients or to render care in a timely fashion. So when you think about it in this case, kind of goes back to what I was saying before, you know, it can really be argued that the misdiagnosis was no fault of the provider and rather it was due to the failure of the technology. And then again, we may have a situation where multiple carriers are trying to figure out who's going to be paying a claim. So we can't not mention cyber and privacy as it is one of the most significant risk factors impacting the digital healthcare ecosystem. So from a, from a privacy standpoint, it's one of, uh, it is of the highest importance that any companies operating in the digital healthcare space uphold the highest standard of cyber controls to protect the sensitive patient data sets that they are that they're housing, that they're storing, that they're accessing, that they're transmitting. And one thing I think which is is pretty obvious, I think it probably goes without saying, is that due to the sensitivity of the data that's being held, being healthcare data, and the fact that the reliance on patient health information and the technology being used to deliver these services can quite literally be determinant of life and death for a patient. Cyber criminals are pretty wise to this, and they routinely target digital healthcare companies for extortion purposes. You know, as they're they're pretty well aware that the inability to do business can lead to significant patient harm, considerable financial loss, and very meaningful reputational harm uh, that may be irreparable. All of these things can lead to claims under a MedMal and tech and cyber insurance policy. And also, these guys are pretty slick. They also know that there's a likelihood that these companies do have insurance policies with you know, uh, pretty high limits in most cases, and they will make extortion demands to kind of try to exhaust the full resources of, of risk management that they have. Yeah, so because of this, it's crucial that companies operating within the space have on board a very um, competent, a very seasoned uh, IT team and hopefully a chief technology officer who can assure that all the vulnerabilities are secured so this can prevent any uh, potential threat actors from infiltrating the network, which can then, like I said, lead to massive and costly data and privacy breach claims and regulatory fines and penalties. And in that case, a lot of times when there is a significant breach, and there are you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions of patients' uh, data that is compromised. This can get flagged to you know, uh, states that it happened in, and a lot of times we'll see um, class action suits filed, which are very, very costly in terms of just from a notification to individuals standpoint can exceed seven figures. Um, Ancillary to what I just mentioned, but also not to be taken with um, without equal weight consideration, a company should really be evaluated on you know their their footprint in the in the economy. So that can be things like how much funding have they received, where has the funding come from, who are the contracts that uh, who are they placing their contracts with, uh, and as mentioned, did they do their, did they do their due diligence? In intellectual property searches, um, what has their claims history been, and is it possible that they can be tied back to any past regulatory investigations? So, coverage considerations. Um, I talked a bit about this already, so I don't know how much more there is to offer, um, but I'll just continue in saying that. You know, companies that are operating on the cusp of healthcare and, and technology, um, you know, while the traditional exposures of malpractice, professional liability, and even general liability to an extent are still present, integrating these technologies with the healthcare services creates emerging threats and heightened privacy concerns. So realistically, you know, I did mention this before, there are three key areas of exposure that should be covered under any policy that's put in place for a virtual healthcare company. So those three 
areas that definitely should be covered are the professional liability piece, which we can basically call uh, med mal for all intents and purposes. The technology errors and emissions liability piece, um, and this should also include contractual liability and IP rights and defamation uh, infringement coverage. And then also, you know, almost most importantly that they have <clears throat> cyber and privacy liability coverage in place. And that is to cover them from both a first and third party perspective. So again, like I mentioned, some of the things that you need to make sure are in place are bodily injury coverage that can arise from multiple triggers. Um, ideally, you'd want to have this coverage in place uh, with a trigger for healthcare services, for technology activities, and for cyber events that even extend to systems outages and ransomware attacks. Um, you'll want to have your technology errors and emissions coverage in place for the tech itself, the, the, uh, you know, for the contractual liability of the supply development and installation of the technology. Um, it's also really important to have coverage in place for products failing to perform. So a lot of companies like remote patient monitoring companies will be utilizing some wearable tech, um, you know, such as glucose monitors, um, pulse oximeters, EKG monitors, um, any tangible product that has been manufactured, altered or distributed by a digital healthcare company, its failure could lead to potential claims. And then, you know, the last but not least, again, is the cyber privacy um, element, which I think we all kind of understand the importance of by this point. So what can companies do in terms of risk management? So really, just like any other business in any other industry sector, risk management and risk mitigation should be at the forefront of any digital healthcare company's ethos and mission statement. So this protects not only the patients who are utilizing their service, but it also protects the companies themselves so as to shield from, you know, any potential cost of litigation, any regulatory fines that can hinder their ability to do business. And then consequently, all of this can um, affect their ability to stay profitable, which obviously is a, is a key consideration for anyone who is doing business as a for-profit company. So some things to think about before commercialization, a digital healthcare company should really conduct a rapid risk assessment to identify risks in all areas across the healthcare, regulatory, cybersecurity, privacy, and patient safety landscapes. Obviously, the use of digital assets and digital technologies does beget a certain level of IT related infrastructure. So it's also super critical that companies have evaluated their tech capabilities to guarantee that their infrastructure can support the business and its operations. And to assure this, again, kind of like with IT and cyber, it's very important for companies to have trained personnel on staff that can advise on these risks and respond to complications swiftly and efficiently. Again, it's hard to talk about any of this in terms of risk mitigation without understanding the, the need to um, have a grasp on the legal and regulatory landscape as it applies to your business um, to whatever extent possible. You know, even if this means having proactive discussions uh, with regulators to determine, you know, best compliance practices where and if possible and how that affects your business and states perhaps that you're operating in. Um, you know, as we, as we know, we live in a time where laws and guidelines are constantly changing um, you know, they're constantly being imposed by federal, state, and local bodies, you know, not only in the areas of standards of care or medical billings and codings issues, but also um, digital healthcare companies would be wise to stay abreast on all federal and local privacy laws that will govern their data management uh, and accessibility practices. Some of the key um, regulations to be aware of would be HIPAA, which I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with, uh, GDPR, which is an EU UK based um, privacy regulation regulation with similar applications, and the CCPA, which is the Privacy Act in California, um, and other states who have privacy laws akin to what they have in California, and a lot of states are trying to mimic that to certain degrees. So 
but you have to also think about a lot of the companies within this space are operating primarily on a business to business basis. So if it's not just an independent, you know, solo practitioner delivering care, you know, through telemedicine, but it's more of a company with a corporate structure and then a friendly PC structure to be in compliance, compliance with uh, corporate practice of medicine laws. Um, it's really important that strong contracts are in place. Um, as an example, AI companies that are leveraging their technology for use by third parties. In this case, it's very important that the contracts are watertight and they as clearly as possible define each party's obligations, what services are going to be exchanged, uh, you know, like, like I said, as clearly as possible. Um, this would also, um, it should also at least include contractually driven requirements that the software providers themselves, like the, the tech company, the SaaS provider, are providing adequate training to the customers who will be leveraging uh, the technology that they are licensing. So in terms of clinical management, um, I think I mentioned this before, but it's essential that these companies are employing or contracting with providers of a very high standard. As an example, they're not bringing on providers who have history of board actions facing their license. Um, this obviously deserves to ensure that the standards of care are upheld by virtuous providers who are aware of the scope of their commitment to patient safety. Very importantly, um, when it comes to providers who will be involved in the prescription of medications, such as controlled substances and narcotics, um, it's really essential that the company does have in force a robust prescribing protocol that must be adhered to and is periodically reviewed by the CMO or the equivalent uh, practitioner. Um, they should also have a robust provider enrollment strategy in place. Um, yeah, as, as a tack on to that, it's very important to have a plan in place to identify unusual activity from practitioners, um, such as things like unusual prescriptions, over-prescribing, um, repeat prescriptions to the same patient, uh, and other things that don't seem too copacetic. Uh, and then they have an investigatory and disciplinary process in place to manage this risk exposure. And again, to go back to data protection, uh, it's also important to lose sight, as I mentioned, that network security threats are one of the major risks associated with digital healthcare. So it's also very important that all the software solutions used by the company's digital health infrastructure are developed with strong security protocols and they are frequently updated. Um, there's technologies out there called end of life software, which basically sends patch, patch notifications when updated technology um, is available so that this doesn't lead to outdated um, services being provided. Also to take it a step further, all third party vendors who are supplying, uh, supplying products and services to the organization should also be thoroughly vetted before they're permitted to access confidential data on their networks because there could be the consequence of a breach that's not actually the fault of the company themselves that is using some kind of IT product, but the failure could be on the end of the IT provider, which then compromises anyone relying on that uh, that technology as they have data interoperability between all these entities. So to some key areas, um, you know, where cyber claims can emanate from, these can uh, arise from a multitude of places. So you have security breaches, cyber attacks from threat actors, which I mentioned earlier, um, unauthorized access to data, data loss or data corruption for whatever reason that does happen. And then this, this one actually is something that I think as human beings we can empathize with. Um, there's a lot of times internal user error. So what this looks like sometimes is, um, you know, someone, a clerical or administrative person who is exchanging patient information, uh, patient records, accidentally sends one patient someone else's health record. Small privacy breach, but a breach nonetheless. Um, also, this can be the result of a phishing attack. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's basically, you know, you have someone who infiltrates uh, a company's network, poses as someone who works in the organization, such as someone in the accounting department or the CEO or whoever, 
um, does a really good job impersonating them, sends a request to someone on a lower level to wire over X amount of money to this vendor ASAP because they need to dump it at the end of the day. Ends up being the case that it wasn't the CEO, it was someone else who just hacked them. And there can be a lot of errors from that perspective as well. So that's why it's also pretty um, consequential for companies to have uh, internal training for phishing scams and simulations so that they know, you know, when something doesn't look quite right, probably don't do it. Um, and again, all these exposures pose devastating risks to the company financially and even for the patients and the providers themselves. So moving forward to legal and regulatory issues. So obviously there's a load of regulatory considerations that need to be uh, assessed by insurers when, you know, when providing cover for these companies. But I think one of the things which is really impossible to mention when having the conversation about regulations is what a profound impact the overturn of Roe versus Wade has presented not only to those providing women's healthcare, but also to the insurable risk exposure for virtual healthcare companies, especially because care is very often just by the nature of how telemedicine works uh, is provided across state lines. So from a legal perspective, a malpractice perspective, a privacy standpoint, we've seen implications in some of the following areas. Um, obviously, we've seen an increase in litigation due to different disputes across state lines. Um, a lot of these things are still being adjudicated in court. Uh, since they're quite new and unchartered, there's very likely chance that this is going to be very costly to resolve because of these complexities. Um, something that is also uh, quite a concern is that there can be legal action against the providers themselves for breaching licensure duties from state medical boards. It potentially could be unknowingly. Let's say that, you know, a patient is said to reside in X state, but resides in another state, or at least was in a different state when something was prescribed. Um, and this violates some trigger laws in certain states. That could be an implication that goes against the provider's license. And sadly, sometimes does come with criminal statutory charges. Another thing, and I think this is, you know, kind of, this has an impact on the on the healthcare sector as a whole, um, but particularly in respect of the overturning of Roe versus Wade, we've been seeing a lot of providers that are actually withdrawing from the industry um, due to concerns over the legal practice and relocating to, you know, perhaps a more favorable favorable environment or just stopping the practice of medicine because they're too afraid. Um, what this ends up leading to is a staff shortage, which we already have, which means that less healthcare professionals are available for care for those who need the care in these certain locations. And obviously that can lead to potential delayed diagnostics and treatment and insurance claims as a result. Yeah, so again, going back to cyber, um, a lot of privacy concerns are present because in certain places, um, the data be can become part of a criminal investigation, and this could leave uh, some patients quite vulnerable uh, to in action against them from law enforcement. Um, in the same breath, you know, there's been some residency programs that are facing a difficult choice between risking prosecution and losing their accreditation or treating patients who desperately need the care that they that they should be, you know, that, that they're after at least. Um, uh, one state in particular that has a quite incentivizing, um, I guess, reward for reporting any of this activity is Texas, where there can be awards up to, or actually even at a minimum, up $10,000 to any individual who kind of gives information to law enforcement about someone who may in fact be seeking an abortion or having had an abortion. So from an insurance risk assessment standpoint, um, insurers will really have to take into consideration some of the following things like, you know, the serious potential for multi-district litigation, you know, whereby there'll be multiple individuals who, students, who are suing the same provider or the same clinic 
uh, from all around the country, you know, which are then basically routed under the same case and settled in the same court. And what that ends up happening is there's just a huge increase uh, in the potential for the aggregation of demands for the exact same incident. So costly from a legal perspective, costly from an insurance perspective. Um, again, more data and privacy concerns. So any women who are using um, health and fertility tra tracking applications um, may want to be a bit careful as well as these two can be subject to regulatory breaches um, based on how the data is handled. Um, a practical example, you know, that from, I guess, from a risk insurance standpoint that we can, that we can look to, um, uh, is the use of a woman's health app for tracking of periods and fertility. So due to the additional concerns for those who are using these apps for those purposes, it's important for insurers and I guess even users themselves when it comes to the data and privacy component about how that data is protected. The reason for this is that these companies have been seen to sell data to third parties, which is not really uncommon. It's not just singling out femtech companies. Um, but yeah, a lot of times data is shared with third parties such as Facebook and law enforcement can even subpoena the data from these companies in states that ban abortion you know, in an effort to show that someone was seeking an abortion and subsequently uh, criminalize them for taking that action. So a hot topic, I know uh, at our at the summit in Washington this past December, um, there was a whole presentation on the asynchronous telemedicine model. So another area of concern for us would be that model itself, uh, the asynchronous model, and how to navigate this against the current regulatory frameworks. You know, a principal concern here um, centers around standards of care and what actually constitutes a provider-patient relationship. And under the asynchronous model, you know, there's a decent chance that this, you know, this standard is not being met. So from a regulatory standpoint, in all 50 states, it has been determined that one cannot establish a provider-patient relationship solely off a medical questionnaire. And, you know, what we've been seeing on our end, but also, I mean, it's, it's pretty widely available just by you know being online is lots and lots of these online pharmacy type digital healthcare companies coming up all over the place um, that are providing access to prescriptions of all sorts of medications, you know, from medication to treat skin conditions like eczema to antibiotics, to hair loss medications, erectile dysfunction medications, and in some instances, even in the areas of controlled substances, you know, sometimes this includes testosterone, Adderall, and even opioids in some cases. Um, in this model, at least on its face, um, it can appear that certain companies could be putting profitability over patient care, um, particularly in respect of subscription models, you know, where companies are providing prescriptions on a re re repetitive basis in amounts that are genuine, generally in excess of any required dosage. And we've seen, you know, uh, from a malpractice perspective and from a regulatory uh, reporting perspective, several DEA investigations against a few different companies in the industry, which have had fines and penalties levied in the amounts of billions of dollars in total against, you know, aggregated, obviously. Um, as insurers, it's important that we're fully confident before ensuring a risk in the space that a strong provider patient relationship is established by a synchronous consultation first and foremost before any treatment and prescription can be uh, conducted asynchronously. We'd also want to make sure that providers are always having access to patient medical records. Um, Another thing to take into consideration is that continuous follow-ups and monitoring prescriptions and treatment plans are conducted and they're monitored and uh, appropriately documented. From a claims handling and claims litigation standpoint, now this is not my specialty. Uh, I'm on the underwriting side, not the claims handling side, but generally speaking, um, in terms of some of the unique challenges, I think I've touched on some of them already, but obviously, the fast-changing regulatory landscape 
comes into play. So it's important that claims handlers, you know, stay abreast and are in compliance with local, state, and federal regulations, which often do differ very much to in-person care. So traditional med mal claims might not be the same way uh, being dealt with on the virtual care model because of these multi-jurisdiction uh, uh, implications. Again, cross-border issues. So there's a challenge that's associated with virtual care companies offering care in these different jurisdictions. So claims handlers really do need to be very well um, up to speed on how the rules and laws apply in each jurisdiction and how that can impact the reporting, settling, and handling of claim. Again, data impurity comes into play due to the sensitive nature of information, you know, working backwards to try to, uh, you know, ameliorate uh, any cyber event is the need to determine that, you know, what level of security was upheld prior to the event taking place. Some strategies for effective claims management. Um, I think something that is super important really is proactive claim management. And this is something that can be done on both the insurer side and the insured side, um, on not just the healthcare side, but also on the cyber and privacy side. So at least on the healthcare angle from, I guess, reporting any kind of malpractice or regulatory or disciplinary type thing, um, it's important that the claims get reported early and are dealt with and responded to early. So um, yeah, the more time a claim does go unnotified, the less likely it is to get resolved for a lower amount. So claims management teams would should be reaching out to the uh, the insurers about their claims sooner than later and find methods to de-escalate where and if possible. Um, I think one of the things that does really help in terms of um, settlement mitigation uh, is alternative forms of dispute resolution when and where is possible, you know, via things like mediation and arbitration. Um, and yeah, I think much like in other types of malpractice cases, like work comp cases, uh, work comp cases, and other things like that, uh, the use of telemedicine and technology experts as expert witnesses um, in the event that there is any kind of, um, you know, uh, expert witness service to, to provide um, is something that really does help to uh, get a better handle and on the claim and help it get resolved as quickly as possible. So some claims examples, I, I kind of gave a, a, a few variations of this when I was explaining the need for these types of coverages uh, earlier, um, but I'll, I'll give an example um, of how something can arise from um, a remote patient monitoring typed virtual care uh, provider. So, there was an incident of an elderly patient who was, you know, living independently, and they were given through, you know, a a, a virtual care company, a um, monitoring device which included a, a wearable that tracked arrhythmia and also tracked gait movement, such as like, you know, to detect falls if that was going to be uh, imminent. It looked like it was going to be imminent at least. And it would send alerts to the care team, to the family members would be connected on the app as well, and also sends alerts to local emergency authorities. Well, in the case that I'm describing here, uh, what had happened was the, the, the patient um, fell. It was an elderly uh, a woman, I believe, uh, fell in the shower and the, the monitor, monitoring heart rate and arrhythmia, it did actually notify the call center, you know, and it did connect to the patient device. However, you know, and that would have kind of been able for the patient to request the emergency service. Uh, in that instance, because the patient was quite incapacitated, um, it didn't end up uh, connecting the patient. And then they tried contacting verbally, but the patient was unable to respond and, you know, what ended up happening very, very sadly is the patient ended up um, dying of very severe burns from the scalding hot water um, after she was unable to get up 
uh, from the fall within the shower. And I guess this just shows you that the usage of this technology when it's supposed to serve a medical purpose and for whatever reason it doesn't, whether it's the software itself or the fact that the patient itself couldn't uh, couldn't utilize it, it, there still are liability implications for the software itself uh, that can lead to a patient having suffered a significant bodily, bodily injury or uh, a loss of life. Um, another quick example, um, stored forward technology. So thinking about uh, a medical imaging company, uh, let's say for the detection of uh, breast cancer in you know using a AI-based uh, picture archiving system, which compares an image that's taken with a, you know, a smart camera against a database of millions of other types of images of similar things to point out to the doctor who's using it, uh, whether or not they think there is something to be concerned about. You know, generally speaking, it's the end responsibility of the physician utilizing the technology uh, to actually make the final diagnosis. Um, however, in this case, the um, the software itself uh, was basically operating too slowly and the images weren't coming through quickly enough. And as a result, they weren't able to um, analyze and diagnose quickly enough. So due to the slow transfer of images, um, the connected uh, device, um, this actually led to a patient death um, due to the trauma and delay caused by the inability of the image. So again, this is another example of how technology and MedMal intersect and how it's very important to have um, adequate coverage in place when you are operating in this uh, in this virtual healthcare space. Um, lastly, some trends that um, I think, you know, I think some of the ones that we're seeing and some of the ones we can expect, um, I think one of the ones that we have been seeing um, and probably won't be going away is the online subscription model um, based asynchronous telemedicine company. You see these a lot um, for men's health type um, services like hair loss and erectile dysfunction. And, you know, a lot of times there's not a great deal of information required prior to getting a prescription. Um, so I think that's going to continue to um, be the case as a lot of these companies have really, really strong marketing campaigns that make people very aware of uh, of their services and easy to sign up for. Um, I think we'll see an increase in cyber and privacy claims that arise from Metapixel and internet tracking tools. Um, this is a pretty hot debate at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Basically, there are different implications in different states of what can be deemed uh, protected healthcare information and some standardly utilized marketing tools to, you know, track you know, engagement with the company's website or business, um, you know, can be seen in certain cases to breach patient confidentiality. Um, and there are quite a few lawsuits in this space, and it's quite an uncharted territory um, in the insurance you know, from the cyber insurance perspective. So I think a lot of carriers are grappling with what the best way to um, ass assess coverage for uh, or the lack of coverage for for these things and maybe how we can find a better way uh, for companies to be more within compliance of patient confidentiality, usually through the use of BAAs with companies that are sharing information with. Um, like I mentioned, I think there'll be a lot more in the wake of IP related claims. Um, I know Krista can remember uh, when I spoke at our digital health retreat in Palm Springs uh, last November, I made the very ambitious and potentially foolish decision to do my whole presentation on generative AI in the healthcare space and how that's going to lead to claims when it was something I really didn't know too much about just because it's so new. Um, but I do think that we will see some claims from generative AI and just for anyone who's not very aware of what exactly is implied by generative AI, um, a very high level definition, convoluted definition too. Um, it's a form of machine learning that has been trained on vast quantities of data, which map patterns across the data 
enabling it to generate similar data that is often very difficult to distinguish from the content created by a human. And as a consequence, this leads to an area of ambiguity in respect to data ownership and intellectual property rights. And then again, we had this situation come across when it was human on human uh, uh, breaches and violations of intellectual property rights, but now we have software doing it. So who's liable, who can pay, who can be sued, you know, in that case, if the output of the data can't be traced back to a person, individual or a company, you know, how does that get litigated? Um, and why does this matter uh, for healthcare companies? So really when, when generative AI is leveraged in the healthcare space, um, uh, whether it has to do with clinical operations, uh, whether it has to do with, uh, yeah, like other banal tasks like clinical administration, the outputs that are produced by these models that can do very significant damage to the organizations that are using them. So companies who are using these technologies can be exposed to a, a, a very long list of IP infringement related cases from competitors, especially if they're using similarly, sour similarly sourced data sets. And I think that's quite an important um, caveat there because a lot of these data sets are you know, freely available for purchase. Uh, whether they're using similar data sets to train their generative AI, AI tools, which uh, produce very similar outputs. Um, two few other ones. Um, I think hybrid models of virtual healthcare will be uh, continue to be on the rise. We've actually saw this being the case since you know the wind down of the public health emergency and the COVID nineteen. A lot of companies that went you know, went fully virtual during COVID because they had no choice or other companies that came up as virtual healthcare companies during COVID because it was a great opportunity. Now we're switching back to using a different, you know, a, a hybrid model really of, of in-person care and virtual care at the same time. Um, that can be a virtual first model where you get triaged electronically through telemedicine and then get referred out to affiliated healthcare clinics. Um, or just uh, your standard practice of medicine that has, you know, an in-person clinic and also conducts remote um, telemedicine consultations for patients living in more rural areas of their state or across state lines. And lastly, but not without very honorable mention is the boom in medical weight loss drugs that are becoming prescribed virtually. Um, yeah, this is something that is seen every single day by every single person, probably in the insurance industry, all these different companies either wanting to pivot their operations to prescribe things like Ozempic and, and semaglutides and you know, uh, you know, Wagovium, you know, they're all the same thing, but um, everyone seems to want to get in on that. And I think we don't have enough research and data on the long-term implications of the usage of these drugs that are typically used to treat, you know, um, serious health conditions and comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. Um, now just being used for aesthetic purposes. And I think that's going to lead actually to quite quite a few claims uh, in the pipeline in the years to come, particularly actually from a uh, GL perspective in terms of the, the drugs themselves, uh, the liability that you know can't really be determined now, but can be determined years down the line of what kind of long-term impacts the taking of those drugs on a continuous basis did have uh, on the people using them. Um, I think I've run over time by a bit, and I am very grateful for anyone who listened, and I'd love to take any questions if anyone wants to ask any, but I do see there's some comments um, from Bianca. Yeah, very much a real thing. It, it's one of the main, um, it's one of the main claims drivers in the cyberspace. Uh, it's kind of been surpassed by ransomware and extortion, but for a while, cybercrime was like the method that all these criminals uh, did. And it was pretty easy to 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 get uh, done, actually. Uh, how do we stay informed on the Metapixel regulatory area? Um, good question. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that. I think we'd have to wait for some regulation to come out. Um, I think the, the jury is still out. Um, I would just say stay and pay attention to any kind of reporting uh, that's put out on it and whether or not Congress or any more local state um, governing bodies decide to put or expand at least their data privacy laws 
to include things like um, privacy breaches from Metapixel and website tracking tools. If anyone else has any questions, otherwise, I very, very much appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for um, answering my question, too. Thank you for this. This was informative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. And thank you thank for you. joining us today. And if you have any follow-up questions for Rob, you could feel free to email me and I'll put you in direct contact with them. Yeah, it would be great. Love to hear from you. Take care. Yeah, Until enjoy your Friday, everyone. Hi, you're closer to it than we are. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere in London, that's for sure. Yeah, take Bye. care. Bye.